Monday Night Rugby on Off the Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Yeah, welcome along. So Monday Night Rugby, we are five days out from the 2022 Six Nations. Round one kicks off in Dublin with Wales in town and then we have England at Murrayfield against Scotland and then on the Sunday, France, Italy is in Paris and we will be up and running. Very happy to say, Rory O'Connor of the Irish Independent is to my right in studio. Hello. Hey, Joe. And Mr Andy Dunn only comes in on special occasions. <laughs> Bringing in the big boy here. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing very well. Thanks, Joe. So uh, just to give people any brief news, Rory, the word from the Irish camp over in Portugal, warm weather training, is that unusually clean bill of health across the board pretty much. Yeah. So there's five or six players who uh, came in with injury doubt under a cloud. Um, three of them, Josh van der Fleer, Keith Thurls, someone else whose name escapes me, uh, Carberry have all trained fully. And then... The other three, Henderson, um, Tyg Furlong and uh, James Ryan, are all returning to training tomorrow. So that is the plan. L- late enough to be starting your first training session of a, of a test week, although they've rejigged the way their weeks work. So I think there's a fairly heavy load on Wednesday now. So once they get through those, Andy Farrell, you know, assuming there's not something we kept from us, which you can never rule out, um, has 37 players to choose from going into the game, which... When you compare it to some of the other teams, it's a pretty strong position to be in going into the Six Nations. Yeah, it sure is. I guess James Lowe, the only exception, but we knew he was out some time ago. Mm. Uh, you've, I'm sure, listened to all the launch day press conferences and all the dispatches. What's the general message coming from the Irish team, would you say, over the last number of days? I, very much uh, focusing on Wales, which, you know, it's quite boring, but, it, it, you know, they're the champions. We're not getting ahead of ourselves. We're not looking uh, beyond that game. Um Tony Saxon sounded a little bit, you know, cautious about them. You know, like the, the, I think he gets a sense that, that Irish people, as we do, are tend to overlook Wales, even though they win it every kind of second or third year at this stage and have beat, you know, beat Ireland last last season. And um, from Andy Farrell's point of view, it was very much that the, the selection is wide open. That just because Ireland beat New Zealand in the autumn, that there's 37 players in camp, that they're all. Um, you know, if you perform well in training in Portugal, you have a chance to get in, and and that's the way he's picking. I mean, it's hard to kind of, it's going to be hard to leave players out who beat the All Blacks in such style in November. Um, were, but cautious optimism, I'd say. You know, Andy Farrell did say that they're out, they're in this to win it, which he said about every tournament so far. If he's finished third as coach in his in his first two attempts, I think he wants to go and, and add this. You know, at the stage of the World Cup cycle, it's a good time to win it, and even just as a head, first would be his first trophy as a head coach. So it will be a pretty important moment for the development of his team. We're also at the same point of the World Cup cycle that we were in 2018 when Ireland went and made history. So it, not that it worked out great the following year, um, but I think it's, it'd be a good time to make a move. How optimistic are you, Andy Dunn, over Ireland's Six Nations champions here? Chances? Uh, very, very optimistic. I love the way um, both Farrell and at, at times I've also heard Sexton say they, they're, they're in it to win it. It's, you know, it's refreshingly honest and open because, you, you, you know, you're placing yourself up for criticism if you don't. But I think that's something that I really welcome in terms of a shift in the psychology of how this, this team works or any Irish team works. We've traditionally never really come out in public and, and set our stall out. And they've even been talking about um, the World Cup you know, and that's come up regularly in terms of we're building towards that um, in order to go and be really competitive if, if not win it. It's a bit more like an English approach type of thing you hear coming out from Eddie Jones or historically what you'd hear from English camps. Um, that allowing for all of that, which is chat, I mean, in terms of my hopes for the team, I think, you know, for for a start... 37 available bodies is phenomenal. It's unbelievable. You look at the Welsh squad, um, obviously they've named a big squad. They've all named big squads, but you look who's miss- missing from the Welsh squad. You're talking about Alan Wynn, Jones, Ken Owens, uh, Falatau, Tipuric. Um, I'll help you out here because yeah. I have it in front of okay. me. Okay. Lee Halfpenny, Josh Navidi, George North, I think. George North, yeah, Justin Tipuric, about 700 caps worth. Yeah. And so. That that alone is is a pretty good start for Ireland in terms of who's available, in terms of what quality they're getting in their training sessions. I also just think the last calendar year has been a pretty impressive year. Yeah, and, what's um, what's been the big difference in the Irish performances, particularly early Six Nations this time last year, and what we saw in November for you? Um, 
I think there there's a willingness to take risks that is um wasn't there in the previous cycle in terms of the before Andy Farrell. Um I've I've regularly kind of harped on about this that the team was very much manicured into holding possession for long periods of time. I don't think it's something they look on as a huge strength. Um holding possession for extended periods of times can have its setbacks and drawbacks in teams hugely and I think um the current team are can be far more they've more license to be direct, they've more license to take risks. You tend to see that in increased amount of offloads, reduced amount of uh rooks and um generally a more exciting uh type of game to play. It doesn't mean it lacks attention to detail in any way, but it does give players license to um certainly to take risks and I think that's the big shift that I've I've noticed. I mean I was at I went to the dubs on Saturday night, the dubs are my game. And I was with I think a fellow you know Paul uh, O'Hare who writes in the Irish Mirror. Um and we ended up we went to Ryan's on Park Eighth Street for a few pints afterwards and we were talking all things sport. We were talking you know, you can kinda of get fed up watching the dubs playing that possession football and watching Kilkenny bring the ball kind of away from the goal, making sure the teams everyone gets in position again and holds holds possession. Um one of the lads who was with us came out with a great line. He said he's getting fed up watching chess, he wants to watch drafts. The point being teams need to change now in sport. If you, Paul himself, who's covering a lot of the football, was saying, you know, the original early games under Stephen Kenny looked pretty, we held possession, but we weren't penetrative. You could look at the dubs football team, they're doing very similar words. Armand and Saturday were hugely direct mm. and penetrative and much great, much more fun to watch than the dubs. In the same way the the Irish rugby team at the moment have become a far more dynamic and penetrative team than when they held possession for multiple phases. I wonder could we extend that across the Six Nations because it's a really interesting point you're making and it, especially in rugby I think more so than a lot of sports around this point out from a World Cup mm. we start to see some shifts in thinking and some planning ahead and where's the game going to be come the next World Cup you look at England you have Marcus Smith who has that ability to run and play off the cuff we know about Scotland and Finn Russell mm. very much in vogue and actually in some respects the Lions tour was one of the great rubber stampings of Finn Russell's approach. Dan Bigger, I guess you might say, is a touch more uh, traditional. Sexton and Ireland have moved in the direction you've just talked about. Intimac, France, Dupont, those direct running lines. Mm. So I wonder, is this an across-the-board movement in Northern Hemisphere rugby that you're seeing? I Yeah, I think it is. Um, it was. It wasn't me came up with that line. Just seems to summarise it so nicely. I want to see drafts, not chess. That was Andy Hanrahan, by the way. I want to give give him the credit. It certainly wasn't mine. We Andy, he was surrounded yeah. by a pundit, a part time pundit like me, and a, a proper journalist like Paul. But he came up with the line that ended up we were we were speaking about. But it was very Andy currently in his car listening to the podcast. Absolutely, going, you fist, see fist pumping. <laughs> yeah, I told I people I know about sport. He also said there's no way I give him the credit. Well, it to <laughs> me. It's it actually really summarizes what's happening in in say northern hemisphere rugby at the moment. Yeah. Whereas two three seasons ago, quite stale Six Nations. You know, multiple phases, fans watching the game thinking this has got really difficult to watch eighty full minutes. And I've heard a lot of people say I never really turned off the TV or, you know, wanted to to not fully watch eighty minutes of Six Nations rugby. But it had got to that point where teams had negated each other. They'd outmaneuvered each other on in terms of analysis and had become quite stale. Now you look at exactly I think those selections, Marcus Smith um, is electric mm. Finn Russell is hugely unpredictable, also very skillful I d I'm not sure what's the um, situation in France, I think Jalabert is possibly injured or borderline injured no, but both, Intimac Both back in, uh, Jalabert okay. has been called into the squad this week, Intimac and Dupont both played at the weekend Okay, well like you know, there again, you've two options who can play that that really um, game breaking, creative style versus game building and not so creative. And I think even in Wales, you've you know bigger as captain. You've also got also Gareth Anscombe, Callum Sheedy, um, who are also being picked in that squad. And I wouldn't be surprised to see either of those getting some game time, regardless of bigger being captain. But the the yeah, the general trend for certain for certain in Northern Hemisphere rugby is that they've they've really taken on a more creative approach 
ironically when New Zealand have, have brought in Joe Schmidt so <laughs> they're, usually, they're usually two years ahead of everyone so they're probably going to batten down the hatches at the next World Cup so yes it's making me fearful there yes, you've uh, yeah, jumped yeah. ahead again uh, I bring in Rory in just one moment any particular reason as to why you think this has happened in the last year 18 months I just think trends I think um, something becomes th- dominant then you got to pick yeah, it yeah something becomes yeah. dominant and what became dominant was possession based rugby which is again hugely taxing in terms of energy levels easy to read for defences um, and over a period of time uh teams get figured out yeah. and I just think it's a trend that has evolved I don't think it's for any 50-22 rule or anything like that no. uh, not particularly I think that's going to help in this Six Nations but I, I don't think it's I just really feel it's probably trends analysis of teams at, a, at the highest level teams learning very quickly how to negate possession yeah. football and now they've all got to work out how to stop this one Well you've wet the appetite I mean if what you're uh espousing very much comes to fruition here over the next couple of weeks we could have an amazing Six Nations yeah. I just hope we're not sitting here when you're next in maybe round three or four and the weather's been terrible and we've had kick tennis and we're saying done you promised us the world and we got traditional <laughs> I'm hoping winter for rugby. the world yeah. for sure how do you see it Rory? Well it's really interesting um, discussion and I think like usually it's the world champions who set the tone and in that November that you touched on, you know, the post-pandemic November where England won the Autumn Nations Cup playing the most productive rugby, you know, kicking everything away. Remember Ben Young's making that kind of infamous comment that, you know, line breaks are the most dangerous things in rugby because you're, mm-hmm. you no longer have support. You know, that, that this, this was a point where rugby looked like it was going down a really, really to a dark place. And Ireland, in fairness, never went that way. They, they, they kind of still followed kind of a New Zealand model. So you kind of come away from that. There's two schools really in rugby. There's the New Zealand and the, and the, and the South African school. And South Africa are the dominant force in world rugby at the moment. They beat the Lions playing horrific rugby. They won the World Cup playing. Like it's, it's a terrible beauty. Like I, I quite like the way they beat England in the final because they, they do have the capacity to mix it. England and France have the packs to be able to play the South African way potentially, but they've chosen to go another way. Having England having kind of dallied with it for a while, Ireland, Scotland, Wales can't. I just think it's, you cannot follow that pattern if you don't have the pack to do it. I mean, Ireland do have possibly the best front row in the world at the moment, so, but it's more a ball-playing front row. You're playing to your team's strengths. And I think when you look at Ireland's direction of travel, it's the switch from Andrew Porter to Loosehead that is the moment where it clicks because you suddenly have three front rows who are highly skillful and also the selection of Ronan Keller uh, ahead of Rob Herring who was very solid but can't do what Ronan Keller can do as an athlete. So Ireland are suddenly at, at the point where they can play mm. all different ways and I think what Ireland are right now is a really difficult team to defend because they have so many options. Every time Jameson Gibson get Park gets the ball, you know he's going to go fast. You know he's got sex in the hip but he also has a pod of three forwards, all of whom are options, all of whom can pass the ball, all of whom are skillful enough, even if the, the pre-planned programme doesn't go right, they can improvise because they're intelligent players as well. Yeah, It's a hell of a place to be, and, and they're all fit at the moment. I mean, Furlong is the big one. If Furlong yes. goes down, suddenly you're talking about moving Porter back, back to the other side. Porter can't do what he does. You know, Furlong's unique in that he can do what he does at tight head. Yeah. Porter becomes more subsumed by the t- tight head role. So. With, with Furlong, just, I mean, one of the amazing things, apart from the fact that he's a, you know, a very capable scrummaging uh, prop, is that, we, you know, there was, a, there was a time there where teams were looking at, can we play a second playmaker outside 10? And who, what would it be? Another 10? Is it a, a, you know, more of a ball playing 12? That's the exact role that he's playing. Like yeah. he's, the amount of time he's touching ball and making the right play based on the defenders that are in front of him. He made two or three close defenders in that channel who are putting real pressure on him and he's making the right choice whether to hit the, f- the first runner, the trail runner. As a, as a tight head, it's phenomenal. Yeah. It is absolutely phenomenal. He's playing a, a ball-playing, creative midfield role and that's not hyperbole on my part. Like It, it is... It is not done. I don't think I've ever seen it done to that extent mm. by any team. Well, he's the future. I mean, in, in 20 years' time, I think these conversations that we have had over the last couple of years about getting a second playmaker involved will seem so basic and reductive. And they'll be thinking, well, they should all be playmakers. Like, yeah. I, you just want a yeah. second one. They should all be able to do it. Uh, that picture Rory painted there is what gets me very excited from an Irish perspective. Gibson Park injecting mm. pace, not to mention whatever, whether it's Paul O'Connell or not, but the breakdown there is attention to detail in the breakdown again, so fastball, and then Sexton in possession with these various pods across the pitch, and it's the skill set of the forwards in those pods that makes Ireland very dangerous. I mean, I'm almost wary of saying these things out loud because I feel we'll fall flat on our face. We, we've only had the England game, and 
the autumn to feel very confident, uh, you know, which is not enough to feel that confident is definitely going to happen. But, but those pictures that Rory mentioned are one of the reasons I'd be very excited for the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I think we're all we, we're all a bit scarred from our history and traumatized from various iterations of great Irish squads or generations that never quite pushed through and didn't get you know never got beyond the quarters in a World Cup. I also feel, by the way, New Zealand didn't have as much tape to look at as all the other five nations do now. You know, we, mm. the performance against New Zealand really they it was a very iffy Six Nations, and it was the England performance, and mm. then poof, it blossomed. Mm. There'd been a lot of, there'll be a lot of very smart people looking at what Ireland did in November and trying to come up with ways to stop it now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, you're, you know, are we? Are you right to feel trepidation that we we seem to be in good <laughs> nick? I don't know. I like. Can we not feel good? That we're in <laughs> no, good nick. No, we can't. <laughs> Glass half full here. Glass half. I full. know, but I think I think teams are inevitably they're they're going to spend time on analysis how do you stop them mm. I think uh, I don't, it's, it appears tonight I have no ideas of my own but I'm only quoting other people Peter Coyle ex Leinster prop I chat with last week he said if I was going after Ireland I would go straight in after um, the scrum in order to try and tire out exactly uh, the key man there in Furlong and get him off the field right. then you're suddenly looking at do you destabilise that scrum which has a massive knock on effect on the ball playing abilities of whoever comes in next and suddenly are, are, have Ireland a second playmaker suddenly are the front five a bit more fatigued um, now Coiler is a prop so props will often say you've got to go in and target the scrum but it, I think it merited um, you know a lot of thought I think the South African model Rory mentioned they they won the World Cup by demolishing team scrums it didn't matter what they could do yeah. in broken field or off the back of a line out they got, get demolished in the set piece by a physically bigger team um, that was South Africa's kind of point of difference so it'll be interesting Though given the names how, the Welch are missing yeah, you'd feel confident Ireland could withstand. No, I strong. think the French are going to go after yeah. us in a and big way, and I think the English will too. Too, and I think the French will test at the twenty-three rather than the fifteen. So, if you're bringing Finley Beelham and Keane Healy at the stage of his career that he's in, on off the bench, I, would, I wouldn't have much fear about Healy or even Dave Kilcoyne if they went that way. But the tight end side of the scrum, Beelham's a fine player, but at that level, he was exposed in Paris, I'm pretty sure, two years ago when Ireland went looking for the title and, and their bench just wasn't up to it. And it's what, you know, a tight five bench is one area where Ireland are maybe looking a little bit light. Uh, and as he develops things over the kind of World Cup cycle, you know, you've lost Quinn Rue, you've lost Ulton Delan, who are both two big locks, mm. um, not star names, but they're part, you know, they, you know, Quinn Rue comes off your bench, he can hold up a scrum, he might not do much else. Um, like that, you know, if, if, if Ian Henderson is fit, then he's there, then you can have confidence in that. But that's, I think, where Paris and London become very, very difficult. You know, the home games I'm less concerned about. I, like Wales, I don't think will test Ireland at the scrum in that way. They'll test them in other ways. They've got some of the best wingers, you know, in the in the game, and they've got mm. pace and they've got inventiveness. But I think I think Andy's right. I think that's where like Ireland have played the last the vast majority of their games under Andy Farrell at home, and their record at home is very good. But they they have been at home. We haven't had any summer tours under Andy Farrell. You know, it's it's two years since we went to London and Paris. That's a big test for this yes. team to do what they did against New Zealand, but in in a full Stade de France with everyone you know screaming and roaring at them with a French team they believe in who just hammered Italy in the opening game. That's where the test really comes, and that's where we really will know whether this Irish team are actually on the track that we think they are, because it's easy to do it against the tired New Zealand. Not easy, but it's much easier to do it against the tired New Zealand team in Dublin. Yes, could we uh, skip through the Irish starting fifteen and just see where we are and what the big selection dilemmas yeah. are? Front row takes care of itself. Done. Yeah. If Henderson is fit, it's him and Ryan. Oh, I wouldn't think so. Uh, Henderson hasn't played since December and Ryan has missed a good chunk of play and Tyburn is probably the form lock in Europe at the it's moment. It's funny that though. I, so heard I think even, against Wales... I heard Bernard Jackman even on the 42 recently saying there is still, you know, within the game... Okay, yeah. Look, all of us, we see the jackal and we see what he does and we say, look, what this guy's the best. But within the game, there is a there are certain basics you have to do and there is still a concern it's, over his size in the second size, row. Yeah, I think, I think you start him against Wales, you get... 20, 30 minutes in Dean Henderson's legs and then you maybe rotate them for, for Paris and then you get the energy of Byrne coming off the bench. Okay. Very hard not to pick Ty Byrne at the moment. I mean, he is in sensational form and he's a very intelligent player as well. Plays into that ball-playing game that, that Ireland are playing and Henderson has done it cold before but it's been a while. He's had a very disjointed season so I think it probably is Ryan and Byrne. Okay. Um, for those reasons. Back row? Uh, Doris, uh, van der Fleer, Conan, presuming van der Fleer is fit. Yeah. Gibson Park, man in possession, Sexton. Yeah. And then 
Henshaw. Hugo, Hugo Keenan certainly in. Yeah. And then give us midfield and the two wings. I think Henshaw Ringrose, um, it's harsh on Bundyaki who's having a very good season. It's probably harsh on James Hume as well, but yeah, like he's done a lot, but he's kind of relying on Gary Ringrose getting injured at some stage. And even then, you could go Aki Henshaw. So it's very difficult for him it's to get It's rare the three team. of them are fit. It is. It's really down. That makes it difficult. Uh, but if you look at the way Andy Farrell's picked his team over the last two years, Henshaw and, and Ringrose have, I think they've been picked seven, maybe eight times. Aki and Hen, uh, it's Aki and Henshaw three times and Aki and Ringrose four times. So I think it is a preferred partnership. They're playing well together at Leinster and Ringrose is in excellent form. Back three. Back, I think James Lowe's a big loss in terms of his left foot. Um, his left foot. Clear, like we don't have a natural successor to James Lowe in the squad. Um, if you're looking at the depth chart, Stockdale is probably that player, and he's not there either. Um, we don't really have a left foot a kicker. McHanson, I don't think, is in the mix for this. I would expect him to go either Earls or Conway. I would think Conway on the left wing and bring Balakun in on the right with uh, with Hugo Keenan at fullback. Okay. Any thoughts? I think the the um, comment is very very true about James Lowe. Um, that left footed option. That uh, certainly in the autumn, one of the most refreshing changes in our game was how easily, not you know, how easily we constructed getting out of our territory, and we did it through maybe one or two wide passes at times to James James Lowe and a sixty meter cannon, um, and for me that was hugely enjoyable to see because I was sick to the back teeth of watching us trying to exit with box kicks and I've never been able to still no one's ever given me a compelling reason why it's a good exit I still can't get it because you have no a chance of getting the ball back you have a chance of giving it away as well 40 metres away from your line it's, sure. it just doesn't make any sense it's a complete 50-50 lottery why would you not kick it 60 metres I guess for, for, a while, for a while it felt like Sorry, I'm agreeing with you. I hate what I'm even saying here. For a while, it felt like it was maybe 60-40 in Ireland's favour. Maybe, it yeah. It's still a big, big a gamble, though, in, in teams that traditionally, you know, like to maintain, had maintained possession. Regardless, I go on a rant about that. No, you're right. I think the that, James Lowe option, um, very, very uh, obviously as well, so, uh, Sexton just kicking some long punts from deep. And so that I think that's going to be a loss. Getting cleanly and efficiently away from our own territory um, is important in this Six Nations and I think that that is going to uh, hamper uh, some of our kind of tactics that loss of the left footer um, other than that I think you, you know, you're, it, it is a team that's kind of picking itself there is that question mark on um, where Tyburn may be included not if possibly if yeah I mean I think he deserves it on his form I just think he fits exactly how we're trying to play and for what you sacrifice potentially in, in that timber in the scrum you make up for it by how well he plays around the field how smart he is how well he, he can connect with other players how destructive he is on opposition ball I think his level of fitness everything but then again you come back to Peter Coyle's point if you're going to go after the Ireland scrum He's he's potentially a weaker spot. Yeah, you see, I think this is a very, you know you, we're done here to a, a romantic back, yes. and us on the outside want entertainment and want moments. I think within the confines of ruthless professionalism, the word timber hmm. carries more weight in the discussion than we would give it. That'd be yeah. my guess. Maybe, yeah. I hope I'm wrong because I'd like to see him start in the second row, hundred percent. But yeah, I mean, I think that that model Rory has mentioned that there really are. There's not too many differing styles in international rugby you're, you're with one or the other that New Zealand lethal kind of offload creativity type game or that turgid timber kind of we're going to grind you down and physically beat you into the ground like mm. in South Africa there's, there's not many people in the middle ground there They've, most even, teams are but even New Zealand other. have 115 to 20 kilo locks who are able to hold up the scrum who can just who are able to play as well and it, there's definitely a school of thought out there that your your tight end lock needs to be a certain size, and Ireland just don't have the player. That's why we signed so many South Africans to play in the second row, which mm. is we don't produce players at that size. And and Byrne is on the lighter side of that. Byrne, in my head, is is probably a six, but Doris is, you know, everyone even outside of Ireland, I think Doris has, has turned heads to the point where people are talking about him as a world leading back row at the moment. Mm. He possibly should be number eight, but Jack Owens, the Lions, number eight, and he's in great form as well. So it's. It's getting your best players in the pitch to some degree as well. I think against Wales, he can definitely get away with Byrne at second row. And France, you know, a bit of freshness and Henderson coming in, I think, makes it. Yeah. Rory O'Connor there of the Irish Independent. Andy Dunn with us as we look ahead to the Six Nations. Rugby and Off the Ball is brought to you by Vodafone, official sponsor of the Irish rugby team, team of us, everyone in. So just a last point or two in Ireland, and I'll get your overview of the uh, tournament. 
Johnny Sexton, Joey Carberry, Jack Cor- Carty, in that order, presumably. Uh, this dynamic of Johnny Sexton, who will be 38 at the next World Cup, still ahead of the pack. That leaves me a touch uneasy. And he, like, against Bath, he was a joy to watch recently. So uh, give us your thoughts on all this. I'm sure you're watching them all very closely. Well, in so much as you can, Carberry. Of late. Well, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's playing superb rugby. There is the, the the there are no question marks about that and ability and experience and leadership. There are, there are question marks based on um, the injury history profile or the the ability to put together consecutive games, and I think that's probably not going to change at his current age. So then you have to look at what is your kind of backup plan should he take a knock. And the question is, do you give Carberry or Carty a maybe a start in a Six Nations game or two Six Nations games that are important and where there's something at stake? Because in the last two World Cup cycles, we have had to start without Sexton in key games on two or three occasions. And players have come in and done had differing kind of responses um, Madigan came in famously and did brilliantly well in the in the first game and not so well in the second match then in 2015 and then Carty um, was part of a kind of a failing system in Japan and took I think unfair criticism but I think there's there's fair um, there's a fair argument to give one or both of them a run in the Six Nations primarily because you're, you're going to say well is Sexton going to put together 12 games in a row between now and the World Cup cycle? Unlikely. And we do need to give the backup some game time. And then from a secondary point of view, the way we play lends itself to those type of players quite well as well because it's not as hierarchical in how we play. Everything used to run through Johnny. Everything was commanded and directed by him mm-hmm. and it, there's a much more shared level of responsibility across the group now in terms of how we play and in terms of our attack for sure and I think it lends itself to the likes of Carty and Carberry coming in more seamlessly we're not suddenly saying Johnny runs everything on the field what do we do we're lost if someone comes in so I, I think it's a very fair argument to give them time but I think there's a clear front runner in that Johnny is number one and it's whether we, we want to look at him do you keep playing him while he's number one all the time or do you protect him tempting to keep playing him isn't it it is yeah winning it Six is. Nations yes it is uh, what about Gibson Park then this amazing dynamic where he's uh, locked in as Irish 9 and I'm sure at Leinster when the team sheet goes up in the wall he's not sure if he's in or out yeah I mean, yeah, and Luke McGrath who I thought had a very good World Cup in Japan in, in 2019 hasn't been seen since you know like like Leinster obviously have a very different perspective on him and Ross Byrne who they quite happily drop in instead of Johnny even when he's fit for big games uh, and, and rotate him and you know obviously have a plan you know have more games to play with but they have a plan in place that if Johnny's not there they just play Ross Byrne you know um, Gibson Park's been a, a revelation for Ireland I really you know I would be honest and say I never thought that he was this good and you know I mentioned Porter being the kind of game changing selection but you know you could argue Gibson Park has been uh, equally as impactful since he's he's gotten the chance and, and Andy Farrell you know he's kept Murray at the start but he brought Gibson Park in for that game in Twickenham in 2020 the Autumn Nations Cup game and it didn't go well and he kind of went back to Murray and then he went back to, to Gibson Park again and, and now it looks like there's a defined hi- hierarchy and the century contract the player is not the, 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 the leading man and that's really really healthy because Conor Murray now has to go like just like Joey Carberry has to knock Johnny Sexton out of the team and ultimately that's what's go- what it's going to take is someone coming along and just going you know you're finished and you're gone like Ron O'Gara did David Humphreys and like the attitude that Johnny Sexton would have brought when he came to take O'Gara's jersey someone has to come and finish him Other- otherwise you know it's just moving deck chairs yeah. um, it's up to Murray now to displace uh, Gibson Park and Murray's now getting heat from Craig Casey from behind him so that's a much more healthy position the tempo we bring is just sensational and it's so key to the way Ireland play and that tempo is what gives the team that oxygen to go and create havoc in a defence whereas Murray can be more ponderous and he wasn't you know, he wasn't bad in that Argentina game at the end of the window but he didn't do enough in that game to, to displace um, Gibson Park in the hierarchy. Yeah, I think it's one it's, I mean, Farrell deserves credit for the Gibson Park selection for sure. So uh, where do Ireland finish in the Six Nations? Home wins and then Paris and or London, what's going to happen? 
I think it all comes back down to Paris. I've tipped them to go to finish first. Um, You're in the. So you mentioned this before you came in in the yeah. Irish Independent. There's a full list of pundits having their With their guests. Today, yeah, twelve. I, twelve pundits. Eleven went for France, and I went for Ireland. Right. So not a lot of faith going over to Paris in, in what is it, 10 days' time. That's the kind of pessimism that makes me feel comfortable again. Well, everyone went for Ireland that's, second, that's, I think. That's, yeah, exactly, right? that's exactly where I want us all to be. It's very Irish. Everyone went for Ireland yeah. second. A solid second, you know, we could take that. I don't think anyone is in as good a shape physically as, as Ireland at the moment. There's huge confidence. The watch, the, the kind of, the, the red flags are the fact that they haven't played away from home very often. And when they have, they haven't gone very well. Mm. Low, I think, you know, it hasn't been talked about an awful lot. But Lowe does, we do lose something when Lowe drops out of the team, the left footer boot, the bit of, I hate the word X factor, but his ability to offload and contact, the unpredictability that he brings, I know sometimes applies to his defence as well, which isn't great, but he does break gain line for you and he gets you out of trouble. I, you know, I think there's a reason to believe in this Ireland team that, 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 that they can do something special this, this spring. England have had an awful lot of problems, Wales have had an awful lot of problems, France have had a big COVID outbreak, you know, they're back on track now, but this France team has a capacity to, to kind of you know, just at the point when it looks like they're coming together, they lose a game they shouldn't lose, and they have to go to Murrayfield and Cardiff. This, yeah. this, and, and that they're difficult games for them. Plus, England come to to, to uh, the start of France, so I don't think to be a grand slam, but I think Ireland come in it. Okay, yeah, France mucked up in Murrayfield two years ago. The, these moments where you they think lost to France or to Scotland in the last game, but the after in Paris game last year as well. Yeah, they d- they still have that wobble in them that they shouldn't. Yeah, given the the talent, so. One of eleven in the Irish Independent going yeah. for Ireland to win the Six Nations. Eleven, I'm amazed. Eleven went Sorry, for one France. Of, one of twelve. One of one twelve. Of 12. Uh, eleven, yeah, went, 11 for went for France. France. Eleven went for France. Journal's going for France. Sorry, yeah, I mean, eleven going out of twelve. Should, yeah, I, I wouldn't. I just, yeah, can understand going for France, but not eleven out of twelve. I'm surprised. They have England and Ireland in Paris. Mm. One of the other things in their favour. Yeah, I would be closer to to Rory here in that uh, Ireland are at a at a really I suppose we're at a really interesting period team looking very strong in terms of personnel the squad is looking very strong in terms of health Um, the management are sharp and um, I think constructively critical of their team and there's a great there's a feel good factor in that squad when you hear players like Peter O'Mahony coming out and saying I've never enjoyed rugby more in the autumn internationals, they're the softer things we n- don't necessarily give huge credence to, but that's huge in an international squad that people are enjoying meeting up. And it's certainly a big shift on what happened in the previous five years where people weren't necessarily enjoying going there, albeit they were working hard and they're being professional. So I think it's an environment that is very conducive to success. I think red flags you mentioned, like the only red flags are. Our cultural inferiority complexes <laughs> on how how we hate being favourites for anything. I, you know, if we can deal with that, we're a young progressive country. Let's deal with being favourites and show what we're capable of. You know, I think um, an incredibly talented group and a, and a really interesting dynamic in the management group. So I'd be quite positive. So you're both in Ireland. Yeah, I am, and I think. And then a red card ten minutes in on Saturday, Jeez. like last year, and it's all over. <laughs> you may as well. We may as well take a position. I mean, I, I certainly was critical at times in the past, and uh, That's true. I'm happy to be the opposite now. In the off the ball piece, in about five weeks' time, on the where it all went wrong, this is the opening scene. Oh, yes. You two, yeah, yeah. Fine. you two. Okay, great. No, no, two yeah. Irelands because France. I mean, generally it's France, France, France everywhere. So two Irelands from both of you. Brilliant. Very good, fellas. And uh, if you want to see the start of Ireland's championship winning campaign, you need to be at the game against Wales. We have a set of three tickets to give away, all with thanks to Vodafone. So to get your name in the draw for the three tickets to Ireland-Wales, just identify our mystery voice who's making the case for Tommy Rooney, absolutely maintaining his place on the football pod. I think so many people underestimate, I think, his strengths. He loves strengths. That's where we play it again. <laughs> I think so many people underestimate, I think, the strengths. Uh, if you know who that is, text your answer to 53106, hashtag team of us. Okay, fellas, I know that was very Ireland-centric, but we wanted to tease out a few of those things. Rory O'Connor from the Irish Independent, thank you. Sure, Joe. And Andy Dunn, great to have you in the studio, appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. Okay, we're back on Wednesday where we have Keith Wood and Stuart Barnes on Wednesday Night Rugby. Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team We all belong to the team of us